read our scripture first, and then uh, Revelation chapter number 2 and verse number 17 says, He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I'm asking you, telling you, whenever you're going to hear somebody preach, whether it's me or someone else, or whether it's even you studying your own Bible in your own time, Say, God, let me hear what the Spirit is saying unto me. God wants to speak to you. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to tune in because of all the distractions that are going on in our life. We've got to quiet ourselves down and say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Say what God wants me to hear. Listen. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of hidden manna. Look at this next part. And will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Father, we pause as we read your word. God, your word tells us that we are blessed when we study uh, the book of Revelation. So God, this morning, help us to put aside preconceived notions and ideas that it's too confusing and we can't understand it and it's it's all weird and strange and let us receive what the spirit of the living God is saying to us this morning about a new name written down in glory father we ask you this morning for your your divine anointing to preach the word and that each of us would have the anointing of the spirit to hear the word in Jesus name amen All right, so we, I don't know how many of you put a lot of thought into, uh, if you've had children, uh, into what you named your kids, if you researched the name and what it meant, or if you named a family name, gave a, a family name, or you named your child to honor somebody that was in your family. But I think uh, that uh, na- this name thing says right here in Revelation 2 and 17 He will give you a new name, which no one knoweth, but he that receiveth it. Sometimes we talk about a lot of other things in Revelation, but I want to stop for just a moment and talk about the importance and the meaning behind this new name. I'm not going to get out there into the hyper-spiritual. I'm not going to tell you that I've got a, 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 a fresh revelation of something brand new that nobody's ever preached before, but I just want to tell you that nothing in God's Word is unimportant. If it's there, it means something, and it's there for a reason. And so there's a reason why Jesus told John, tell them that overcome, that I'll feed them from manna that they don't know about, from the hev- from heaven's tables, and I'll give them a white stone, and in that stone will be a new name written that only him that receives it shall know. Don't get caught up in the imagery. Don't get caught up in all of that. Well, exactly what does all that mean? What's heavenly manna and why the white stone? Let's focus this morning on that one thought, a new name, a new name shall be given to you. So, as I dig into this a little bit this morning, I had a, like I said, I don't know how much thought you got, gave, if you had children into what you named them, if it had a special meaning to you, if you just liked the name, if you gave that child a name to honor some relative or something, but uh, my middle name is Andrew, and that's uh, after my dad's dad, so I was given that name to honor my grandfather. Some of you maybe have a name that was given to you to honor someone that came before you. We had an uncle. He's gone on to glory now. I had an uncle. He was my mother's oldest brother. Everybody called him Bill, and I just always assumed that Bill Stuckey was his name. But his name was A.C. A.C. The letter A, period. The letter C, period. What in the world does that mean? What does that stand for? It doesn't stand for anything. That's just what Grandpa gave him, A period, C period. And it never, he had initials. And I thought, well, that's kind of strange, isn't it? Well, if you had a name AC, you'd probably go by Bill too, you know, because it's it's easier. What does that mean? Alternating current or what's the, I don't know. But that that was his name. And and so I thought, well, that's pretty unique. But did you know we had a 
former president of the United States that had a middle initial that didn't stand for anything. Harry S. Truman. What does the S stand for? S. He was named and given the initial S because he had two grandfathers whose names started with S. And so they compromised and gave him. So why are you telling us all this, folks? Well, you know, uh, several years ago I heard about a, a guy that went into the Army and he was like my uncle A.C. He had only been given initials by his parents. Maybe this was something that was more common years ago. I don't know. But he went into the Army. He only had initials. And so to try to avoid confusion on his enlistment papers, he wrote where it says name R only. Where it says middle name, he wrote B only. And then for last name, he put Jones. Well, guess what happened? Yeah, you can probably guess. From thenceforth, the rest of the time he was in the service, he was now he was known as Ronly Bonely Jones. Yeah, so <laughs> this morning, God has given you a new name, and this is important. Who has he given it to? To those that have overcome. How do you overcome? Our victory that we overcome is the victory of faith. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Father, as your Savior, then you have overcome the world. It may not feel like it right now. It may not look like it right now. You may still have more troubles and problems than you care to think about, but if you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as the Son of God who forgives sin and who is your Lord and your Savior, then you are more than a conqueror. You are an overcomer in Him through Jesus Christ. So God has given you, amen, He's given you a new name. Names are important. They can shape how we think about ourselves, how we view ourselves. The names are that you are given. You know, according to my mom's family, if I show up, if we have a family get-together today, and I haven't been to one in several years, but if we had a stucky family get-together, my cousins and uncles and aunts and everybody that's, that, that knows me on the stucky side, when I show up, they're not going to say, hey, Travis, how you doing? When I show up, it's going to be, Trampus, how are you? And I used to hate the fact that I had this name, Trampus, that's my, my Stucky family nickname, until finally I watched this show called The Virginian, and I found out who Trampus was. Trampus was a pretty good guy, so I don't mind that my granddad gave me the name Trampus. He was a, he was a pretty good dude. Names can shape how you think of yourself, and according to John, here in Revelation, he's given us a new name. In Isaiah 68, 62, and verse number 2, God declared the nations shall see your righteousness and all the kings will see your glory and you will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. The fact that God has given you a new name was declared in the Old Testament through the prophet Isaiah. And then Jesus said it to John the Revelator at the end of the New Testament. You've been given a new name. The world may have known you as a, a uh, they may have given you the name drug addict, but God has given you a new name. The world may have said you were uh, no account and nothing, but God has given you a new name, overcomer. The world may have said you were dying of a disease, but God has given you a new name. The world may call you no count, nobody from nowhere, but God has given you a new name. I'm telling you, He has given you a new name, a name of righteousness, and it is a name to give glory to God. The, the very idea that God would give us a new name is intriguing. And when I began working on this message for today, I just couldn't help get very far away from that old hymn that shares the title of the title of my message this morning that says, I was once a sinner, but I came pardon to receive from my Lord. Uh, this was freely given, and I found that He always kept His word, and there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. And the white-robed angels sing the story, 
A sinner has come home, for there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sin forgiven, I am bound for heaven evermore to roam. There's a new name written down in glory this morning. Amen. Brother, sister, and it is yours. Well, what is it? It, that will be revealed to us when we stand in the presence of the Lord. But can I tell you right now, it's child of God. And I tell you right now, you may have been, uh, who knows what your past was before the cross. That's the point that I'm trying to, to get out to you. Who knows what your past was before you came to the cross. It may have been something that you're proud of, and it may have been something that you're ashamed of, and it's probably a mixture of of both of those things. But when you come to the cross, when you come to Christ, there's a new name written down. He doesn't write down sinner, liar, cheater, adulterer, or whatever it was that you were known by before. He doesn't write down angry person, irate, jealous, envious. He doesn't write down that kind of a name. He says, child of God, son of the Father, born again, blood-bought, redeemed, changed by the power of God. God and something that is new needs a brand new name. So God has written down redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed by God. We are changed. And it's important to understand the devil knows your past and he will call you by your old name right? He'll call you by that sin that you used to be known by, by the character that you used to have, by the way that you used to live. Hey, three-pack-a-day smoker, or hey, you know, drug addict, hey, whatever it used to be, God knows your past, but He's given you a brand new name. He calls you son. He calls you daughter. <laughs> he calls you my child. He says, come on, I've got a table prepared for you. You don't have to go by that old name anymore. In fact, I want you to know that it's a new name because you are a new creature. We have been made new in Christ. This is the part of this that I, that I really like the best because I have to Travis has to remind himself sometimes we are not a renewed creature. We are a new creature. We've not been renewed. Man, I tell you what, you can get some pretty good secondhand stuff out there. You can find some pretty good secondhand clothes. I've worn quite a few from resale shops and, and whatever. You can get some pretty good secondhand furniture, and sometimes you can get a pretty good secondhand car or motorcycle. But folks, you are not a second-hand, hand-me-down creature that God took out of the kingdom of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light and said, well, maybe if I just put a fresh coat of paint and a, a new set of tires, it'll be all right. But no, he has made you a new creation in Christ Jesus. Behold, all things have passed away and all things have become new. That includes me. Uh, if anyone is in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, that person is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. We've been given a new name because we are a new creature and the old is gone. I may be used to walk in things and do things and participate in things that, that, uh, that uh, were a part of my nature before the cross, but praise God, I don't live there anymore. <laughs> I've been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. And not only me, it's not just me because I'm the preacher of the, uh, the pastor of the church. Everyone, Paul said, who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ has become a new creature. The old has gone and the new has come. I don't feel very new, preacher. I still feel the desires. I still feel the drawing of, of the old life. Well, you know, you've got to stand on faith in the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not under the power of Satan anymore. You have been freed to live under the power of the Holy Spirit through God, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are able to resist every temptation to return to that old life. 
when Satan stands outside and calls you by those names that you used to go by. You tell him, I've got a new name written down in glory. I don't have to smoke anymore. I don't have to drink anymore. I don't have to do the drug culture anymore. I don't have to do whatever those old things were anymore because I am made new in Christ Jesus my Lord and my strength and my happiness comes from Him. Folks, let me tell you, what does this mean to us? It means, first of all, that we have received forgiveness Those whom God makes new, He has forgiven. Forgiveness. Peter wrote it this way. Jesus bore our sins in His body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. Man, we quote the very last portion of that a lot. By His wounds we have been healed. But what about the rest of it? He said, not only the healing, but the forgiveness that comes because of what Jesus did for us. He bore our sins in His body on the tree that we might die to sin but be alive to right living, righteousness. That big old word righteousness just means right living. Just right living. Living the way God intends for us to live. Our records haven't been just forgotten about or just pushed to the back of the drawer or, 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 or in some way covered over. I'm talking about our record of our life before the cross. Our sins, our transgressions, our failures, our shortcomings, anything in our life that wasn't pleasing to God was forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. I know I say that, but I think sometimes we don't want to forgive ourselves. We want to hold on to things ourselves, and we want to say, oh, but I've been a bad person. I I haven't lived a, a very good life, and I've made a lot of mistakes. But if you have come to Jesus Christ and asked for forgiveness, confessed Him as your Savior, then those things are forgiven. We want to work it off. We want to pay it off. We want to do something to make it right, make some kind of penance. But folks, there's no penance in the Bible. There is simply come to Christ and receive His forgiveness because the work was finished on the cross of Calvary when Jesus bore that cross up the top of the hill and they pierced His hands and they pierced His feet and He hung suspended between heaven and earth on that Friday until He lifted His voice and said, It is finished and He gave up the ghost and He he died. He died so you can say, Lord, forgive me, a sinner. And that price has been paid. Preacher, you're hollering a lot this morning. Well, I get excited when I think about the fact that he's forgiven me free and clear. Free and clear. It's done because Jesus finished the work. Did you know that Christianity stands alone in its concept of free forgiveness The way that we think of, it's free for us. It cost Christ a lot, but it's free for us. I've done studies and surveys of other world religions, and while some of them have a mechanism by which you can absolve yourself, they have this idea of karma where you want to do more good than you did bad, and the good will outweigh the bad, and they have other ideas. Christianity stands alone in the fact that God took your sin, your badness, your shortcomings, your failures, He took them on Himself and He paid the price. (laughs) And He offers you free forgiveness for that. He doesn't hold it over your head. You ever been in a... Don't poke anybody in the ribs when I say this. Just I'm asking a rhetorical question for you to think about. I'm not expecting an answer. Have you ever been in a relationship with anybody who would uh, say they forgave you but a few months or weeks or a little bit of time down the line, you'd do something else wrong and they would throw back at you all the things that they said they forgave you about? Nope, never been there before. Well, I've had the, uh, I've had the unfortunate uh, uh, privilege of, of working with some folks and being around folks who'll say, oh yeah, I'll forgive you. And then the next time something wrong comes up, they bring back all the stuff that was supposed to be forgiven. 
Folks, when God says forgiven, it's forgiven and forgotten. He erases it from the book. It is gone. It is done. He never again brings it up to you, no matter how terrible, how dark, how wicked, how evil, no matter what it might have been. If you have truly asked the Lord to forgive you of that thing, it's gone in the records of heaven. It's gone. You know where it still exists? In your memory right? And, and uh, in the kingdom of darkness, there's a recollection of your wickedness, and the devil will try to remind you about it, but it is done in the official record. God says it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I remember one time uh, as a very young Christian, and I, I was praying about something that I had asked God to forgive me about in the past, but something came up and I started feeling bad about that again and I started praying about it and the Holy Spirit said to me, God doesn't know what you're talking about. That doesn't exist anymore. You're asking Him to forgive you of something He's already erased from existence. That blessed me. That gave me joy because although I might feel bad about it, my father has erased it and it is gone. Being new means being forgiven. As a Christian, other religions don't have anybody that can forgive them. They can teach them a way and a path and a method or something that you can do. But we have somebody. We have somebody in Christianity who can forgive us. He is our Lord Jesus Christ. And he has said, if you will confess your sin, he is faithful to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteous acts. Romans 5 verses 8 and 9 says, God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were still sinners... Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So how much then does God forgive me, preacher? How much does he forgive me? Here's my favorite verse on that subject. I've had people say, how many times will God forgive me? Is there a limit on how much I can get forgiveness from God? Let me show you this. If you don't know this already, write it down. You'll want to go back to it from time to time. Psalm 103, verses 11 and 12. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. His love is higher than the mountains. It's higher than the heavens. (laughs) Higher than we can imagine. In other words, there's no way that we can ever use up God's love for us. It is boundless and endless. I was seeing something on the news this week about they're in the process of launching a new orbital telescope that's going to allow them to see light from galaxies that are so many light years out there just you know it boggles the mind about how far away these things are in the universe they'll be able to see the light from them and study things from this from this telescope folks as high as the heavens are above the earth so great is the love of the lord god for us there is no end to it They say there's an end to the universe out there somewhere. Uh, Whatever. Uh, It boggles my mind. I can't imagine it. What's on the other side of that? You know, what's on the other side of that? But folks, I want to tell you something. There is no end to God's love. In other words, you cannot mess up so many times that God won't forgive you. You can't mess up. You cannot mess up so many times in one day that God said, you've exceeded your limit. Please wait for tomorrow. (laughs) No, God forgives you as often as you come to him and ask, God forgives you. You know, it frustrates me. I've got so many things that require passwords. You ever do this? You forget your password and you keep trying until it locks you out and says it won't let you try anymore for 24 hours. Yeah, yeah. God's not like that towards us. If I have to come to him 
many times in a day to say, Lord, there's my anger again. Please forgive me. Oh, Lord, I shouldn't have said that. Please forgive me. Oh, God, God's love for us never ends. Now, think about what the psalmist said in that verse. This is one of those things that just blesses me greatly because it shows that God inspired somebody to write something that they couldn't even understand at the time that they wrote it. You know, at the time that they wrote it, the known world was, was fairly small, right? To people living in Palestine, they didn't know much beyond just a few hundred miles of, of the earth. Not a whole lot of the earth was known. Over to India a little bit and a little bit north up to, you know, maybe the, the southern borders of Russia and maybe as far away as Spain and just, you know... Parts of Africa were the known world to them. It wasn't a very big place. But he said here, as far as the east is from the west, shall he remove our transgressions for, from us. That's beyond the understanding of this guy who wrote it. It is ordained and spoken by God because now, folks, we know that on this sphere that we live on that rotates in space, you can travel. If I start right now by a compass and I travel north, I'll eventually get to a place where the only way I can go is south. You reach the northern apex and everything else is south. I can travel south until I get to a point on this globe where every other direction is north because I've reached the southern pole. But if I were to start out from here today and travel due east, I can travel due east for the rest of my life and never get to the end of going east. Right? What is that saying to me? God has completely removed your sin. There is no place where it still exists. It's gone. In other words, God's forgiveness doesn't know any. End. There is no place where God will say, no, no, I'm done with you. I'm not forgiving you anymore. As far as the east is from the west, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is God's love. Somebody needs to hear that this morning because you're kind of down on yourself. You're kicking yourself because you keep falling into that same ditch, keep habitual, this thing that you think you've got a handle on and then it pops up again. Maybe it's your whatever. I'm not going to name the issue, but you know what I'm talking about. You have a problem or maybe more than one that keeps popping up and Satan or your own flesh is trying to tell you, see there, you're not really a child of God because you still don't have victory over this. I want to tell you, child of God, as long as you live in this earth, you will struggle with dirty feet. What does that have to do with anything? Jesus said, guys, let me wash your feet. Peter said, no way, Lord, no. I'm not going to wash my feet. Peter, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, unless you let me wash your feet, you can have no part of me. So Peter says, Lord, well, then not only my feet, but wash all of me. Jesus said, Peter, he who has already bathed doesn't need to bathe again, but only he needs the cleansing of his feet. What are we talking about? Folks, when we're saved, we don't have the need to continually get saved again. We've bathed. We've been washed by the blood of the Lamb. We've been saved. But living in this world, dirt from this world, from, from our humanity, from the flesh, we get dirty feet. And we need to come and say, Lord, forgive me of that lie I just told. Lord, forgive me of those thoughts that I've been having of, of anger. And Lord, forgive me of those things. It's like dirt getting on our feet. It doesn't cancel our salvation. It dirties our feet. And Jesus says, let me wash that away. I don't know if that makes sense to anybody but Travis, but it makes sense to me. We walk through this world and we get, you know, we have to, we have to, we have to be washed. And Jesus says, as often as you want to come, I will cleanse you of your sins. The great preacher D.L. Moody once said, God has cast your sin into the depths of the sea, and he's placed there a sign that says no fishing. <laughs> I like that. How do we become a new creation in Christ? Well, it's pretty easy. How do you become a new creation in Christ? How do you get that new name written down in glory? It's really easy. How do you do that? You become a Christian. How do you become a Christian, preacher? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Oh, well, the demons believe. You've got to believe more than just Jesus is. You've got to believe that he died in your place and that his death pays for your sin. You've got to believe that he was raised again on the third day. And because he lives, you can have eternal life as well. You see, a lot of people can go with me as far as saying, oh, I believe that Jesus existed. But can you believe that his death paid the price for your sin and that dying he was raised again and that because he lives, you can have eternal life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? You must believe not only in Jesus, but you must believe in him as your personal Savior. The Scripture says you must repent of your sins. So how does that work? Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God who came into this world to save me from my sin and that because you died for me and was raised again, I can have new life in you. Now, Lord, I ask that you would forgive me of everything that I've done or anything that I've said, Lord, that's not pleasing towards you. Forgive me of my sin. That's how that works. It's really easy. And then, fourthly, you must confess Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. Believe that He is. Believe that He is your Savior. Repent of your sin. Confess Him as your Lord. Uh, Confess Him with your mouth. You see, you do that in two parts. (laughs) The first thing is you actually just say, Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I have been born again. Thank you, Lord. I confess that you are my Lord and my God. And then as soon as possible, you need to confess him by being baptized in water as a public sign that you have made an inward change. We confess him. And then for all of us that have been saved, that goes on day after day, doesn't it? We continue to confess the Lord Jesus Christ by the way we work our jobs, by the way we love our wives, by the way we spend our money. We continue to confess that Jesus is the Lord. So now let me go back to something that I said briefly earlier. You have not been renewed in Christ. You've been made new. And let me try to give you an illustration as we move towards the end of this message today about why that's important. Let's say, can you, <laughs> when I was a kid, we used to say play like. I don't know if y'all up north know what play like means. Let's pretend. Let's imagine. <laughs> we had to play like, you know. We'd go outside and pick up a stick and, and play like it was a sword or, a, you know, or, or something. We, we pretend, we'd pretend. Let's imagine this morning that your great-grandfather was a, 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 a craftsman, and he made a beautiful uh, dining room table and chairs by his own hands. He made it as a gift for your great grandmother. And that passed down to your grandmother, and then it passed down to your mother, and now it has passed down to you. But one of the chairs of this beautiful six piece, six chair set broke. Now, you not being a craftsman can take Gorilla Glue and baling wire and duct tape and, <laughs> and you can stick that thing back together because you don't want to just throw it away. It's, it's, it's got great value to you, at least sentimentally, because this is a family heirloom. It may not be worth anything on the market, but to you it's priceless. And so you could do that. You could take your duct tape and your Gorilla Glue and your baling wire and you could, you could you know... As we say down south, Jerry rig it, or Southern engineer. <laughs> Put it back together, and it, you know it may be even stable enough for you to sit on, but you're not going to be proud of that anymore. It's going to look awful and ugly. But let's just suppose that you have an uncle in your family who still has the skill at woodworking that he learned that's been passed down all the way from grandfather, great-grandfather, who taught his son, who taught his son, and now it's been passed down. And so he says, oh, I heard that the chair broke. Let me make you another. And he uses the same wood and the same tools maybe that great-grandfather used and the same skill that great-granddad taught to his son who taught to his son and he crafts you another chair that's identical. Now, 
you can have the renewed chair that you tried to fix or the brand new chair. Yeah. We thank you, Uncle. You've made the set whole again. Well, that's the best way I know to illustrate the fact that we've been given this gift of life through God and man, sometimes we absolutely destroy it. And we can try to stick it back together with Gorilla Glue and duct tape and bailing wire. And sometimes we do better than others. And sometimes we're satisfied with our efforts to put things back together for a while. But then we grow dissatisfied. And we try to fill that dissatisfaction with a new house or a new car or a new cell phone or a new relationship or a, a new something. We try to fill it and we find that we can't fill that void because the old chair is just broken down and it needs to be not renewed but it needs to be made new and here stands the master of the universe who made you in the beginning who says bring me the pieces that you have left and I won't wrap them around with duct tape and and super glue but I will take the pieces and make an entirely new creation out of you how could we say no to such a gift and what will it cost you you ask nothing but faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to bring the broken pieces unto him and to let him make you new again. You see, I think a lot of people struggle at this point with not feeling worthy for God to make them new. Well, I've made my life such a mess. I knew better. I was raised better. I didn't have to do the things that I did. And so I knew a guy who God delivered him of cigarettes Several years later, going through a divorce, he picked up the habit again, started smoking, and he came down with <clears throat> emphysema. And he would say, no, don't pray for me about that emphysema. That's my fault. God delivered me, and I took the cigarettes back up, and so this is just my cross to bear. Folks, he somehow missed that psalm that I read to you earlier, that God is more willing to forgive you than you can imagine. And so what I'm saying to you is this. It, it reminds me of a story about a, a little girl back many years ago who uh, the church bus would come by and her mother would let her go to church. But before she would leave, before she would leave to go to, to go to Sunday school on the church bus, she would ask her mom for her mom's locket and her mom would take off the locket and give it to the little girl. You see, it came out years later. It wasn't that the little girl thought that the locket just was so pretty she wanted to show it to everybody, but she knew her mother valued the locket. And if for some reason she got left at church or those people wouldn't bring her back home, she knew her mother would come to get the locket. She didn't think she was worth anything, but the locket was. Folks, let me tell you something. The Scripture says you are the apple of God's eye. You know how much He thinks you're worth? He sent His only begotten Son to die in your place so that through Him you might have everlasting life. The most valuable thing He could give, His life, He gave not just for the whole of humanity but for you as an individual. God thinks you're worth a lot. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. And Ephesians tells us we were dead in our trespasses and we're by nature the children of wrath like the rest of humanity. But Luke 19 and 10 says Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Paul says because of his great love for us, God made us alive together with Christ and we are saved by his grace. You see, Jesus said, imagine that a shepherd had a hundred sheep and upon returning to the sheepfold, he found that one was missing. He put the 99 in the fold, and he would go back and search for the one that was lost. And then he says, having found that one, he would put that lamb on his shoulders, and he would return home again, and he would call his neighbors and say, Rejoice with me, for that lamb that was lost has been found. Folks, what's he saying? He was saying every soul matters. Every person matters. All of us 
matter to the Lord. He's not satisfied with all the people that are already in heaven or all the people that are already written in the Lamb's book of life. He is looking for that one more that'll come. That one more that'll come. He's looking for that one more. And so I want to stop today with this thought. The very same thought that I began with a while ago when I started this message. I was once a sinner, but I came pardon to receive from my Lord. Uh, this was freely given, and I found that He always kept His Word. And there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine, and the white Robed angels sing the story, a sinner has come home, and there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, oh yes, it's mine. With my sin forgiven, I am bound for heaven nevermore to roam. Amen. Father God, I pray this morning that you would touch each heart and each mind that has heard the message this morning. Lord, there are those maybe who are struggling with feelings that they don't matter. There are those that are struggling, Lord, with feelings like they are failing you somehow because they are struggling with a, a sin or an issue or a stronghold in their life. There are those this morning who maybe feel like they just don't matter to you. But God, this word for them is, I have given you a new name, and it is preserved for you in heaven. You are not who you were. You are who I have made you to be. Believe my word and not the, the word of anybody else. Believe what I say to you and not what anybody else says. Believe what is written in the Bible. Stand on it. Even when you don't feel it, believe the truth of my word and my word will set you free. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your promises. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Will you stand with me for a moment of invitation before we all dismiss? Let me say that uh, I do plan to have service at 6 o'clock tonight for anybody that's able to come. I don't think we're going to have any surprises today from the weatherman. So let's uh, plan to come back tonight if you can at 6 o'clock. We'll worship the Lord again then. But for right now, as we stand here this afternoon, I want you to just turn your thoughts upon the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't preach a message like this without giving a chance for one who is lost to come home. So this morning, whether you're watching online and, and, and seeing this, or whether you might be in this room this morning and you realize that I have never believed on Jesus as my personal Savior, I've never confessed my sins to Him and asked for forgiveness, and I have never confessed Him with my mouth as my Lord and my Savior, I need to come this morning. I need to do that before I leave from here today. These altars are open to you. If you need to come home, if you need to come to Christ, if you need to accept Him, believe on Him, and confess Him, then I'm asking you this morning, while I pause for just a second, would you come? Just step out. There's no shame. Someone will come right behind you and begin to pray with you. If we're all saved, then I praise God for that, but I don't want to have it held on my record that I didn't give somebody an opportunity to, to, to come to the Lord after preaching a message about heaven and salvation this morning. I want to ask you, church, then this morning, if there's anybody here that you have need uh, of prayer by the laying on of hands, pastor, it's cold and flu season, and, and there's all of this. Well, okay, if you desire prayer by the laying on of hands, then I will be more than willing to pray and lay my hands on you and, and pray for you today if, if that's your desire. Otherwise, I will pray for you as a congregation, but these altars are open if you'd like to come for one-on-one -on -one prayer. 
Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you would touch in this congregation today and bring healing, Lord, to each and every one that needs healing. Bring forgiveness. Lord, this message was not preached for no reason, and there are those today who struggle, Lord, with feelings of self-worth, with feelings, Lord God, of struggle and, and with failure, and like they're coming up short. Lord, I pray right now for victory for every child of God in this room right now, that we would realize that we have not just been renewed, but we have been made new by you your power working in us and through us. Oh, God, break off the shackles and take off, Lord, the things that, uh, that, that hold us back and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. The Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. Bring peace.